All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 16 to begin our time of worship. The Lord is King, lift up, lift up thy voice, sing his praise, sing his praise. All heaven and earth before him now rejoice, sing his praise, sing his praise. From world to world the joy shall ring, for he alone is God and King. From sky to sky his banners fling, sing his praise, sing his praise. The Lord is King, let all his worth declare, great is he, great is he. Bow to his will and trust his tender care, great is he, great is he. Nor murmur at his wise decrees, nor doubt his steadfast promises. In humble faith, fall on thy knees, great is he, great is he. The Lord is King, and bow to him ye must. God is great, God is good. The judge of all, to all is ever just. God is great, God is good. Holy and true are all his ways, and every creature shout his praise. The Lord of hosts, ancient of days, God is great, God is good. The Lord is King throughout his vast domain. He is all, all in all. The Lord Jehovah evermore shall reign. He is all, all in all. Through earth and heaven one song shall ring. From grateful hearts this anthem spring. Arise, ye saints, salute thy King, all thy days sing his praise. Job 33, for our scripture reading. This is a speech given by Elihu. It's not one of the three friends that at their time condemning Job, the Lord brought Elihu who is a faithful friend to Job, as far as I can tell, and he said was true to the word, and certainly one that the Lord purposed should come along and, I believe, point Job to Christ in his affliction. I know the scriptures say that he was an upright man and shoot evil, but that was before men. That's how men could perceive him. This would be a businessman that was honest and did business right. But before God, he had to be brought low and taught his need. And I believe that's what this affliction was all about. And the reason I know that is because the very last chapter of Job, Job confesses that where he said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, in other words, through the preached word, but now mine eye seeth thee. In other words, there was a, an opening of his eye to behold God in Christ, just as he is. And the result, he says, wherefore I pour myself and repent dust and ashes. Wherever there is a true work of the Spirit of God, there's going to always be that result. Repentance is a one-time act. People have been made to believe that, that you walk an aisle, say a prayer, you repent, and now you're done. No, it's a continual turning of the heart to Christ by the Spirit of God, prayerfully daily and moment by moment. But here in Job 33, Elihu 
This name means my God is he. So I believe truly a representative here of God that he sent for Job. Not to condemn him, but to point him to Christ. So he says, wherefore Job, I pray thee. So you can see even with what tenderness that he speaks with Job. Hear my speeches. The Lord had already laid on his heart a number of words. We don't know how long this lasted, but Job wasn't going anywhere. He was sitting on that ash heap, scraping himself with broken potsherds, and had all the time in the world. Many times the Lord brings us low at times like that for the purpose of drawing us to himself, and, and then brings along people such as Elihu to instruct us. And so he says, hearken to all my words. I'll just hear the parts that you want to hear. Hear every one. And he believes that it's the Lord causing him to speak, which is truly what we want. We don't want to just speak inadvertently. We want to speak as the Lord gives directions. So he said, behold, now I have opened my mouth my tongue has spoken in my mouth. It's an interesting way of putting it. It's pretty much saying, I, I've tried to hold my tongue, but I can't hold it any longer. It's time to speak. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart. And I don't believe he's saying that out of any self-pride. That word uprightness means the transparency of my heart. Job, I'm speaking to you now from my heart, not just from the head. And he says, my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. You know, when a person speaks from the heart, it's out of knowledge, wisdom, thought that the Lord has put there. He said, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. I like that. When a person begins to speak, what's the first thing that comes out of their mouth that has to do with who God is? And that were it not for the Spirit of God giving him breath, him having his being and life in God, he couldn't speak. He couldn't even address Job. And he says, if thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me, stand up. In other words, cut out the pity party. You've been hearing Job's complaints. And all of this revealed the need for repentance even in Job. Because even though when the Lord afflicted him initially, it says that he charged not God with sin, we don't find him charging God with sin in an angry way, but at the same time bemoaning the place where God had put him which is ultimately being angry with God. So he says, stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. Paul said that, that we are ambassadors of Christ. We speak in his stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Again, he's acknowledging to Job that what he has to say to him, he's no better. I also am formed out of clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. I'm not here to terrorize you, Job, by my words, but rather to exhort. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I've heard the voice of thy words, saying, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Job was looking for some particular sin, even as his friends encouraged him to do, which so often, whenever affliction comes, isn't that how we reason? Well, I wonder what for what sin God is chasing me right now. Well, we are sin. But here he's justifying himself in that there's nothing that he can put his finger on that would be the cause of, of God chasing him. And it wasn't necessarily so. Here God was chasing him to draw him in his need to Christ. He 
He said, Behold, he findeth occasions against me. He counteth me for his enemy. Even though he wasn't, yet that's how his heart saw the heavy hand of God on him. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I have. Where the Lord shuts up your way to where rather than see his grace and mercy, you see nothing but wrath. You see nothing but justice. Again, the Lord brings his own through these times, lest we should put any confidence in his flesh. He putteth my feet in the stocks. He marketh all my paths. In other words, I'm a tracked man by God. Behold in this, Elihu says, Thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Again, this is the Lord using Elihu to get his eyes Job's eyes off himself and unto who God is. God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. When any of us get into that mindset of why and questioning God, that's a bad mindset because he, he doesn't give an account of his matters. You can sit there and try to figure it all day long, but he doesn't owe us an answer. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Think about how often God in his providence speaks. I mean, he makes his hand to be known and manifest. And we go by just like little kids running by, but nothing doing. And so when the Lord stops us up short, all of a sudden, we're thinking, now he's got our attention, but he's been speaking all along whether we perceive it or not. Here he says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed. Is there any dream that a person can have that you could just say, oh, well, I don't know where that came from, or I don't know why I thought that, or there's nothing that ever occurs, even in a dream, of what God has ordered. There's a reason for these things. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. So we know that God is in creation. Firmaments declare his, his glory. We know that he reveals himself in his word. That's certainly how we find instruction, but he's also God of providence. He speaks through providential dealings with his children. And when he gets our attention, he opens our ears. He opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. We learn from these things, unless we be reprobate. But here's the reason that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. If these things, the Lord did not exercise us, our hearts in affliction and in his providence, where would we end up? Where would we be? We would be continually building ourselves up. That's the pride of the heart. And so the Lord withdraws man from his purpose. That's why in James it says, if you say, I want to go here or there to market, always say, if God will. Because he can stop you up short, lest we be caught up in pride. And so the Lord works. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. In other words, his providential dealings are such that it's to keep us from further evil, from going the way that we would go. And so he keepeth his soul from the pit. All of these barriers that Lord puts in the way are barriers that it were he not to so direct our paths then we would most certainly end up in destruction so I'm thankful it's like road bumps along the way he is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain what do you do when you get pain Take a, some medication to 
try to get rid of it because we don't like pain. But pain here, according to what I'm reading, is all part of the Lord's chastening to remind us, if nothing more, of our mortality. And you think, the older you get, you think, where's all that coming from? I didn't know I could have pain in these areas. Well, that's the Lord. And the chastening, don't think of punishment. Chastening is just what the Lord uses to remind us that we're nothing but clay. Sometimes it's, we hold to these things with a death grip. We like to have the good old days. We like to be back when we could run and go and blow like nothing was. And now we can. I know in my own life, the way the Lord has got my attention is just let me flat on my back. It comes out of nowhere. I'm pretty healthy for the most part, and then all of a sudden, man, you're down. There's nothing that you can do to change it, but the Lord has purposed all of this. To the point that his life of fourth bread and his soul dainty meat, you put what would normally be a joy in front of him to eat and not hungry. The Lord takes away the appetite. So as, as the Lord brings any one of us through these various afflictions, we don't just shrug it off. We see his hand in all of these things. To the point, even with Job, his flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that we're not seeing stick out. I've seen different artists' renditions of what they thought Job must have looked like in these boils all over his body and not eating and just really on death's door. And you stop and think, God would do that? Yeah. This was God who had his hand on Job, not to destroy him. As we know, it's never the case when he chases any one of his children. It's out of love. Whom the Lord loves, he chases. But here's the whole purpose for it. To cause Job, because he began as a rich man, and had much wealth in which he could divide, but at this point in his life, how much do you think that mattered to him? The Lord just continually taking it all away. But the reason is, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. In his mind, even as he said there, he thought that God considered him his enemy. It was just to that point of despair. But that again was for his good because it caused him to cry out for a mediator. This is where I said Elihu is pointing him to the Lord Jesus Christ. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one to stand between, a go between, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. I don't read that wrongly. To show unto man God's uprightness. We're nothing but sin, but he is always just in what he does. And when the Lord so deals with one of his own, then, verse 24, he is gracious unto me and saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. This is Elihu pointing Job to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's ransom. That he despair of himself and that he be utterly cast on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Now, did Job know that his name would be Jesus, or that he'd be born in Bethlehem and all? No. But these of the Old Testament knew that there was one that God had appointed who should come and be their Savior, be their Redeemer. I've found a ransom. You can see the connection there between salvation and the ransom. Where there's a ransom, there's salvation. Without a ransom, there's no salvation. So God has purposed salvation for those that he has chosen as his children, and it's by that ransom death. That's what a ransom is. It's a payment. Not in the blood of bulls and goats, but in this one. Deliver him from going to the pit. I have found a ransom. This is the father speaking concerning his son. And his flesh shall be fresher than a child's, and he shall return to the days of his youth. That's, that's talking about the spiritual effect of God showing a sinner Christ. 
whereas that sinner languished in a lost estate for as long as God has purpose and now reveals Christ. And if anybody that's been lost knows what I'm talking about. I know that's how the Lord has directed my heart. That I was run along like Job, thinking myself to have had many accomplishments. And I'll tell you, when that arrow hits the heart, you drop it. I saw a video the other day of a, an officer chasing a man down the street. And there was about 30 feet between them, and he had one of these taser guns. And when he shot him, he went face plant right down into the, into the concrete, stopped him in his tracks. Mm -hmm. Didn't kill him, but they took him down. And I thought, that's exactly how the Lord deals with any that he draws to himself. He'll bring them low before he raises them up. But oh, when he does, his flesh shall be fresher than a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. How's he going to pray unto God? But through his mercy, through his grace, like that publican in the temple, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And he shall see his face with joy. He shall see God's face with joy. Paul described that as seeing the excellency of, of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to see God's face. For he will render unto man his righteousness. Again, don't get that wrong. He's not rendering to man man's righteousness, but he renders to this man, described here, God's righteousness, which is because of the ransom. For the ransom's been paid. There remains nothing but righteousness to impute. That's what took place at the cross. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right and it profited me not. See, that's the confession that the Lord by His Spirit brings out of those that He's drawn to Christ. He will deliver His soul from going down to the pit, and His life shall see the light. Yes, it's the Old Testament, but you can put Christ. Christ the light. You'll see Christ is God's glory. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. We may not see it. We might think, well, who in the world is there and who God's working? Well, look at yourself. If you're rejoicing in this message of Christ, then that's God's mercy and grace. But oftentimes, only the Lord knows that number. I just know it's a number that no man can number. It's what the scriptures say. To bring back his soul from the pit and to be enlightened with the light of the living. The light of the living. The light of those who've been made alive by the Spirit of God. Who is their light? It's Christ. Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace and I will speak. Because remember, he started off by saying, you got to hear this all the way through, Job. My speeches. There's a point here that the Lord has put on my heart, and I need you to listen. Oh, that God would shut our mouths and cause us to listen, even in reading this scripture. Elihu, being dead, yet speaks. If thou hast anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify thee. I believe Elihu looked at Job and said, I truly believe you're one of the Lord's. So I'm not here to criticize you and put you down. I'm, like he said, I'm nothing but clay, even as you. He says, if not, hearken unto me. If there's still some resistance in you, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. Again, not said in a prideful way, but teach thee of Christ. Who are our best friends? It's those that are brethren. It's those that point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't try to help us reason through stuff like the world does, but simply points us to Christ. And there's no greater friend than that. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this word that you have preserved for us even to this moment and that you're able to use for our instruction. I pray it will be that even as Elihu spoke to Job, these words speak to our own heart. Cause us to be bowed in your presence and to own that you are right 
in all that you do. And to thank you, Lord, when you do bring us into affliction and chasten us. Not out of wrath, but out of love. Lest we should put any confidence in this flesh. And that our eyes be turned to him who is your ransom. The one who paid the sin debt. That you might be a just God and Savior. Oh, we have so much to learn. I pray that you would shut our eyes, shut our mouth, and open our eyes. And cause us, dear Lord, to reflect once again this evening through your word upon Christ and his glory. We give you the praise and honor in his precious name. Amen. 340 in our hymn book. And then we'll take a look at our study in 1 Kings chapter 1. 340, nearer, still nearer. In our position, we can't be any nearer than we are in Christ, but in our heart experience, we know that we need Him to draw us. 340. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart draw me my Savior so precious thou art fold me oh fold me close to thy breast shelter me safe in that haven of rest shelter me safe in that haven of rest nearer still nearer nothing i bring not as an offering to jesus my king only my sinful, now contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies, I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last. Till safe in glory my anger is cast. Through endless ages ever to be. Nearer my Savior, still nearer to thee. Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to Thee. All right, well, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 1. This really just continues the history of David as we've been looking at it. It's a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. You really don't know who was the author of these books. The Jewish tradition says that it was Jeremiah, and perhaps so. We don't know. 
that's not important. We, we know who the author is, and that is the Spirit of God. And what we read in this book is a continuing record of the history of redemption, the rising up of kings. That's why it's described here as First and Second Kings. Originally, these were all one book. There wasn't a First and Second Kings. But for the purposes of reading and study, at some point, it appears that they divided up into two separate books. But that even being said, we know that it's still one book from Genesis to Revelation. It's the record that God has given of his son. It covers a period of about 500 years of history. We start to think our nation hadn't even been around for 300 years. We're talking about 500 years of history that has been selected. Some people get upset with that when you say that the Bible is not a chronology of uh, history in all its detail. It's selective history. It's just like John said of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many things that he said and did which are not written. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus the Christ is the Son of God. And that's how we read the scriptures, with eyes open. This is not just a simple history, but it's showing us how God, raising up kings and putting them down, was still directing in all things through that seed from which his Son should come keep that in mind, then just like we read in Job, we don't question God. There's things in here you're going to read and you might be shocked and think, what? And God was directing in that? Yes. Even in that. He said, I create evil and I create life. I'm God. And he does it all for his purpose. So, here we, we see in verses 1 through 4, to begin with, just paragraph by paragraph. Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat, couldn't get warm. Therefore his servants said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord a king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. That would create some heat, wouldn't it? So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. Was past that age of being able to intimately know her. Now David here, from our best estimate, would be probably around 70 years old. For some of us that may not seem too old anymore the closer we get to it. But David had had a pretty rough life. It began pretty early when the Lord brought him out as that sheep herder. And he was anointed as king and from that time on spent the rest of his life fighting or maintaining that power that the Lord had given him. This was a, an embattled warrior, far cry from Moses who lived to be 120 and Jacob who told Pharaoh even at 120 his years had been few and full of trouble. Here's David at 70 years of age considered to be advanced in years and unable to get any comfort. He seemed to have lived the lives of maybe four or five people in that lifetime. And it says here that he they covered him with clothes. It's an interesting word. It just means that he was so disabled in his weakness that at this point he never even got out of his bedclothes. It was in that sense that he just laid in bed, too feeble even to rise from his bed. I still remember a friend of mine who 
got up in years, and the Lord took him at 88, but when he would talk with me on the phone, sometimes he'd call me four or five times a day just because he was wanting to have fellowship in Christ. It's the one thing I cherish as I look back during that time, but you know, he jokingly said, Ken, don't get old. He said, I thought that my heaviest days were behind me, but he says, this is an endeavor. And I know that the Lord has determined my days, but it's not easy. And I thought about that even with regard to our lives. We live long enough. Our most grievous trials may yet still be before us. Sometimes you look back and think, oof. Thankful for how the Lord brought me through this, but there still is that river of death and the dying process that we all must face if the Lord grants us long enough life. And we're going to be completely cast upon the Lord and His mercies and His grace. We don't find David here even at this point seeking any kind of help himself just lying in bed and passing his days now when it says here in verse 2 that his servants said unto him this word servants is an interesting word as well these this is another word used in scripture of physicians so he had a group of physicians around him that that was their one purpose was to make sure that he was treated properly and had the proper help he needed. If you look back in Genesis chapter 50, and I don't want to get too off on these details, but it does show us how this word is used. When Joseph encountered his father after all those years, Jacob, It says, Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And notice, and Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, this is after he died, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. So Joseph commanded his servants. This was the custom that these that were kings had these servants or physicians at their beck and call. Now, the part here that may be surprising to some is the solution that they had. And that is to seek out a virgin, and this was no small thing, to stand before the king and let her cherish him. We know that David had many wives and concubines, but perhaps this one, at the end of his life, would be one that would steal his heart and make him glad, make him merry. That's all they sought to do was to cheer up David. And so they went out and sought this virgin. And it says she was a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel. So they sought and they found this one Abishag, the Shunammite. I'm not going to try to enter into too much detail here as far as how this would have enlivened him. But I do know that back in the day, this was one way in which they did treat older people to find a, a virgin, one who had not yet even had children, to lie next to them and create that natural heat. It was thought that when a woman hadn't had a child yet, that she created more heat than anybody else, and so this would be a good solution. But Abishag the Shunammite, I don't know the connection. I'm still studying this, and I never like to speculate on God's word, but there appears to be too many similarities between this Shunammite woman who was brought in for King David but after he passed, she still remained part of that harem, if you will, that was passed on to Solomon. And when you read in the book of Song of Solomon, particularly 
in Song of Solomon chapter 6 and verse 13, it's difficult not to see that it may have been all along that the Lord brought in this Shunammite woman, not so much for David, but for Solomon. Because the whole book of the Song of Solomon is about this one woman that was the object of Solomon's love, undeserving, and she acknowledges it, and yet the one upon whom he set his affection. And you can see in verse 13 these words that are addressed to this one who is the fairest among women. When Solomon the king here had withdrawn himself and she began to seek him. You can see in verse 1, O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? And I believe the book of Solomon, Solomon is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just some natural love story. But of all the women, here was this one on whom he set his affection. It's a picture of of all that are out there in the world as far as sinners, that the Lord has set his affection on one bride, on one woman. And that's why it says in verse 13, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shulamite? And that says, as it were, the company of two armies, a strong woman, one that was strengthened by the love of the king for her, just like we love him because he first loved us. So that's in process of thinking as the Lord has directed my thoughts, the connection. And we know another example where there was a woman brought to another providentially, but in unusual means. And I'm talking about Ruth. When uh, Elimelech was sent down there with Naomi and his two sons. The initial son married this woman Ruth and then the Lord took him. But the purpose was to draw her out of Moab and bring her to Boaz who then he married and from that lineage comes David the whole lineage of Christ. We, we can't question God's providence and sovereignty. I just know that everything that was taking place here wasn't so much just for a story, but it was the accomplishing and fulfilling of, of God's purpose. But we can see how she cared for the king. It says there that she cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. I think of how the Lord brings any one of us as sinners to Christ and we cherish him we minister to him but it's not in any kind of physical affection most people when they think of love that's how they're thinking of it. it's not it has to do with a heart drawn to Christ her heart was drawn to David at this particular point even though there wasn't any physical relationship there that would normally draw a young virgin, or draw a, a woman, all of it for his sake. And so now we begin to see how this story unfolds, because here's one, then Adonijah, you can see in verse 5, the son of Hagath, what did he do? Exalted himself. Here we are at the end of David's life. And the Lord having spared him to this point, and we think that the last of rebellion has already raised its head, and now David's going to die in peace, but no. Here's this one, Adonijah. He would have been one of the remaining sons of David that was alive, that had not been killed. He would have been David's fourth son. We know that two of David's three sons that were older than Adonijah were dead. That was Amnon and Absalom. Remember we studied that in our study in Samuel. And 
we suspect that the other son that David had, Chiliab, or Chiliab, however you want to pronounce it, was either dead or unfit to rule, because we never see him mentioned again after 2 Samuel 3, verse 3. You go back there, that's the last mention of this one. So here's this one remaining. This would have been the oldest son of David. And so you stop and think about it, being the oldest son, by the custom of the day, you would think, well, then he's heir to the throne. What does this remind you of? It's like Jacob and Esau. It's, it's not the younger that will serve the older, but it's the elder that's going to serve the younger. That's how God works in his sovereignty. It's not as men think. And so Adonijah, when it says, here he exalted himself, he's thinking, this is my time now to seize the throne. We never learn from history. He was evidently blinded and not seeing that those that sought to take that throne of themselves, it did not end well. But here, being exalted himself, isn't that where the problem begins in this flesh? Wanting to exalt oneself above measure. But here again is where we see God's sovereignty, and that is that the the rule, the succession in the kingship, all throughout the history, God determined that it not be hereditary, but rather that God himself would determine who would be his king. And that's the way it is right on down to Christ. I have set my king on my holy hill, it says there in Psalm 2. This is years before Christ even came. But Men have sought and devised many means around it. And uh, even to the point of crucifying Christ, thinking by putting him to death, they would be rid of him and never have to deal with him again. And yet in all that, they were accomplishing God's purpose. And through that, God raised up his son and set him on the throne where he rules and reigns today. He's in glory. They can't get their hands on him. So Adonijah here in his presumptive heart, which again would be our case should the Lord ever leave us to ourselves, because we know how pride raises its head in these hearts of ours, and the Lord has to bring us low. That's why I read the chapter there in Job 33 about Job, to be brought low and brought to, to Christ in repentance. Now, ultimately, we're going to see at the end of this chapter, probably not get all the way to that, but Adonijah finds mercy in spite of this. Solomon shows him mercy. I would say for David's sake. This was David's son. But it's a reminder that left to ourselves that, that presumption of the heart would destroy us. It's God that exalts, it's God that abases. There's a scripture in uh, Psalm 75, if you look there with me, Psalm 75 and verses 6 and 7, that describes this. And let's be aware of this too, even with regard to politics of our day. It's not going to be by men's deciding. I know we vote and we do all of that, but ultimately it's the Lord. Or even in our everyday lives, when it comes to our work, who is it that brings advancement? And who is it that holds back? It's the Lord. Lest we be lifted up in pride. Here in Psalm 75, you can see in verse 5, lift not up your horn on high. Don't be touting your own, blowing your own horn, basically. Horn was a sign of strength. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west, nor from the south. From north, south, east, west, west. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. 
he's going to prove his hand even in this with regard to David and who would succeed. It, it didn't even turn out to be the one that people thought. The one who would succeed David was Solomon, who was the seed of his union with Bathsheba, who after he had gone in done to her and God took that child, yet God put a love of David for Bathsheba where he married her and that seed Solomon was the one who would then reign in his place and from, from that would come Christ many years later. Who could have ever thought of that? We'd have had Bathsheba off in some isolated place separated from David, but no, David, the Lord put a, a love for her in David's heart and caused her to become his wife. And he loved her. That's how the Lord works. And I know some may say, well, we've got to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. Well, it's true, we do, but it's the Lord that humbles us. And that's what we're going to see here even with regard to Adonijah. Now, I often say the Lord will give people enough rope sometimes to hang themselves. And when I read here in verse 5, who does it remind you of? When it says here, Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself, saying, I will be king, and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. This was his entourage. When I read this, I thought of Absalom. This is exactly what Absalom did as he rebelled against the Lord. And yet, two different outcomes. Again, I'm giving away the story here a little bit because Adonijah found mercy in spite of his rebellion. It's, it's a good example of any of us that are lords, who can say that they have not exalted themselves? Who can say that they've not been lifted up in pride? Who can say that they've not sought their own direction, their own way? That's how we're born. All we like sheep have gone astray. What is it to go astray? It's to turn every man to his own way. Then it says, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's where mercy is to be found. For David's sake, we can say for Christ's sake, Adonijah found mercy. Whereas Absalom didn't. The Lord took him out. Even that we don't determine. It's the Lord. But here, in effect, this was a personal military force when it says that he had chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. He's already declaring himself king against what God had purposed. Men can act against God, and yet in the end, it's God's will that is always accomplished. No man can ever thwart God's will, even though they might say unto him, what doest thou? God's will be done. But you can see here a statement that's made, and this shows how David was a man of the flesh. You know, all of these kings and types of the Old Testament, they were but that types. They had to, they had to fail, lest we should revere them above measure. And what, to me, this is one of the greatest examples that this word that we're reading wasn't written by mere men, else you wouldn't find this in the word. But here it says in verse 6, and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And so the statement here is that his father was kindly toward him, found it hard to discipline him. And for that reason, some say that this was the result. He was a very good-looking man. When it says he was a very goodly man, that had to do with his physical stature. And so had these attributes, which ultimately only contributed to 
and this delinquency. And again, these are matters that we commend to the Lord. And I think all of us as parents look back and on our children and think, well, if I had disciplined them a little more here, or done a little bit more there, that somehow the result would be different. Ultimately, the result here is exactly as God had purposed. Whatever his upbringing, whatever David did or didn't do, treating him kindly and dealing with him as he did in growing up, the end result was for this purpose, for this hour, for this moment. And it's only as we see these things through the eyes of providence, God's providence, that we come to rest in this. Regardless of what happened back here, it was for this purpose right now. So we see Adonijah here at a banquet and again wanting to be inaugurated as this king while David lay in weakness. It says he conferred with Joab the son of Zeruiah. Remember Joab was a confidant of, of David's all his lifetime. Fought many battles for him. He was David's chief general. And Abiathar, the priest, he was the high priest of Israel. And these two men actually supported Adonijah. It shows how men can at one point perhaps serve the cause of the king, but at the same time rebel and go against that cause when given the opportunity. And the problem is these did not consult the Lord. These were looking for an occasion themselves, thinking, well, David's on his way out, so we've got to add our own situation, make sure that we're taken care of. So in one sense, it is. It's sad to see these once trusted associates of David now turning against him late in his life. We don't know, again, the motive for all this. Joab may have sought revenge for David's choice of Amasa over him, or that back in 2 Samuel 19. And Abiathar might have been jealous of Zadok, the high priest, because it says in verse 8, but Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Ray, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. There's always going to be a divide when it comes to God's anointed king, versus men and who they desire. You just, you can expect it. That's true even now with Christ and who he is and the gospel is preached. Men take sides. But those that are true to the Lord, you'll not be able to dissuade them away, regardless of what other men do. And so we see here Nathan and Zadok, here the mighty men who belonged to David. They were not with Adonijah. But you can see how this banquet was prepared. Verse 9, Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoeleth, which is by Enrogel, and called all his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. Again, he's declaring himself to be that successor to David. Claiming that right. But Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty men and Solomon his brother he called not. You can tell when people are up to no good when they don't involve everybody in what they're doing. They, they made a divide. They knew that these here, Nathan and the mighty men, remember the mighty men? Those are those 600 that were with David all those years. They, they, they knew, he knew better than to touch them. These had been kept for David, right on up to his death. It's a picture of God's elect and how he keeps them in Christ. And Solomon, his brother, he called not. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba. So he, he kills these, he sacrifices these sheep and oxen and, and fat and calf when it says he slew them. I don't think that this was just for some feast that he was having. I truly believe that 
he offered those sacrifices. Those were these were animals that were being offered as a sacrifice of the Lord, covering his rebellion with an outward form of religion, like this so many do. It's like Adam and Eve in their disobedience. They covered themselves with those fig leaves so as not to appear naked before the Lord. And yet this was not a sacrifice that God would accept. So we're going to stop there because our time's gone. And we didn't get beyond verse 1. But here's where next time Nathan speaks unto Bathsheba. Mother of Solomon saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? So we're going to see how the Lord directed you know, through that next time. The Lord will. God's appointed heir is not who men think. It's not one that's by popular vote, that's for sure. Nor is it so with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, he's God's heir. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 51, and then we'll be dispensed. Hymn number 51. Praise the Savior, ye who know him, who can tell how much we owe him. Gladly let us render to him all we are and have. Jesus is the name that charms us, He for conflict fits and arms us, Nothing moves and nothing harms us, While we trust in Him. Trust in Him, ye saints forever, He is faithful, changing never, Neither force nor God can sever those he loves from him. Keep us, Lord, O oh, keep us cleaving to thyself and still believing till the hour of our receiving promised joys with thee. Then we shall be where we would be then we shall be what we should be. Things that are not now or could be soon shall be our own. All right, we'll have a good rest of the evening and we'll see you when we're supposed to.